conversation for after <laughs> the brief. You know, so well, we we're starting Cyber Command now, so yeah. of course he has slots. All right. Uh, Anyways, uh, let's go. All right. So I'm going to blow through these really quickly. It's kind of a combination between uh, command level slides and like personal slides that I've put together uh, from Dahlgren. Um, so uh, mostly what we're going to go over today is what I've had experience with in the past like seven years or so, or it's six years. Um, as uh, Patrick said, I got a new job up at US uh, Cyber Command um, based out of Fort Meade, um, but also at the Pentagon. They've got offices at both spaces. Um, where I'm actually going to be doing a lot of like mission based engineering type of stuff. So, like, you know, our sponsor, people that give us money, right? They'll come to us and say, look, man, <laughs> I see you can. <laughs> they'll, they'll come to us and say, look, man, we're having this problem in the field. Um, like our war fighters are either getting hurt or killed in this in this way, or maybe you're having a log logistical problem in the field in, in whatever battle space it is, right? And so our sponsor will say, hey, can you engineer a solution within six months to mitigate this threat? And that's what I do now. But since for classification issues, I can't have slides on that. So what I'm gonna show you is what <laughs> what I'm gonna show you today is a lot of what I what I did leading up to accepting my my new job that I have now. So uh, what is Dahlgren? Does anybody know what Dahlgren is? Yes? Some of you do. Uh, Dr. Chain definitely knows what Dahlgren is. We actually, um, so, but this says everything right here. We are trying to lead warfare systems development specifically for the Navy. So we are trying to make stuff that can beat out our adversary stuff, right? Um, so think of a DDG-1000, right? Uh, that has tons of different technology on it that, you know, is designed specifically uh, to defeat a adversarial capabilities, right? That's what we do. Um, and we're located in King George. This is King George County right here in Virginia, up in the northern neck. Um, and you see the outline of the river range there. We actually do like a lot of shooting uh, with a uh, uh, large Navy gun shooting, uh, like five inch gun, rail guns, things of that nature, down the, this entire stretch of river. Uh, which is, you know, I want to say 30 or 40 nautical miles. Um, I don't know for sure off the top of my head. Strategic thrusts right now, um, again, I've already mentioned kind of the railgun thing, but there's a lot of other things that fall under railgun. There's also, as far as directed energy is concerned, you're talking about lasers, um, you're talking about uh, improving uh, energy density system, like systems that, that carry a lot of, of power for you, right, in a smaller package. Um, I kind of hit on this too a little bit, mission engineering, right? How are we better coming up with logistical tactics for beating our adversaries in the, in the field? It's kind of like systems engineering, but you're applying it to like what are our troops and our ships doing right now, right? How can we logistically improve the decisions that they're making in order to defeat our adversaries? And then one of the hugest thrusts thrust right now at Dahlgren is cyber warfare. As you know, stuff's getting hacked every day, right? So not only just for computer systems, like adding protections in there for computer systems, but like in my line of work, right, I mentioned we field like specialized products that go out and do a specific mission to beat the bad guys, right? Well, we have to build in protections for our stuff too, because if it gets found, that's not good, right? So we have, you know, things like anti-tamper, whether it's a physical, you know, actually, you know, kind of like a kinetic anti-tamper, but also have like a, you know, a chip lower or software anti-tamper, right? Like, so, so that's like, that kind of falls under cyber warfare engineering as well. So, um, kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, Dahlgren, it's a huge base. I mean, there's almost, these numbers are really old, um, but our budget's probably close to 2 million now, and, or 2 billion now. And we, between contractor and federal government, we uh, employ about 10,000 people. Uh, so, I mean, that's huge for that area. And, and this is where I was gonna say a little bit about Hampton Sydney. Since I graduated, or, or before I graduated, I could only count on one hand uh, the amount of Hampton Sydney students that worked at Dahlgren. I've been working at Dahlgren since 2008. Uh, I started as an intern. And, um, and gosh, I, I didn't know anyone who, who came from Hampton Sydney when, when I came here as a freshman. 
since I graduated, we have, I, I want to say we at least have 25 or 30 students working at, at Dahlgren now, which is a big deal because Dahlgren is a huge laboratory, right? So you've got schools like, you know, VCU, you've got schools like Virginia Tech, you've got schools like, I don't know, at, I mean, even people from MIT, you know, come to work at Dahlgren. It's like you've got all these big schools who are competing for spots, and yet at Hampton Sydney, we have 30 plus people working. I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome. So, so we, we like to continue that trend. And just like, uh, you know, Ben said, um, you know, if stuff that I talk about today, like, interests you, for those of you, the collegiate brothers that are here, Come up and talk to me. Um, you know, I can I can think of a number of hires that we've had just from you know, like Ben said, collecting resumes, looking at it, you know, sending it to HR. You never know, right? And we'll get again. I've got more slides a little bit on that. <laughs> um, I've already mentioned academia, so I'm not going to highlight it. Hampton Sydney College here. You know, we actually have a formal agreement with Hampton Sydney College. Our HR has a formal agreement, right? Um, which is a big help in the hiring process. Um, there's more warfare centers. Dahlgren's not alone uh, doing a lot of the similar things. Some of them are focused on submarines and things of that nature too. Um, already mentioned the Potomac River Range um, where we you know, fire five inch systems and railgun systems, right? Um, we also have a big explosives facility too where we actually do missiles dropping. Um, we'll do fast cook off tests where we'll actually put a missile in a high thermal environment, like a very stressful thermal environment, and actually force it to blow up. Like we're, we're trying to make it blow up, right? Um, we've got uh, UAV runways. Uh, we've got the electromagnetic launch facility, which is where I worked for a little while. Um, and we've got directed energy lasers where we're actually firing uh, laser systems over the water there, as you can see in that diagram. So now getting into like kind of what I guess the theme of this, this whole discussion, right, is, um, as I said, I, I started at Dahlgren in, in uh, 2008 um, as an intern, but uh, came to Hampton, Sydney, and I, and I will tell you that when I graduated from high school, I thought I was going to, like, go to Virginia Tech or something. I, I thought I was going to, you know, try mechanical engineering there or something. And then my mom got me out of bed on a Saturday morning, and I didn't want to get out of bed, out of bed and she said, you need to come tour this little place called Hampton, Sydney. And I was like, why do I need a tour there? That's an all boys school. In the middle of summer, why do I need it? Why do I need it? And, and if she didn't get me out of bed that day, I don't think I'd be standing here right now. Uh, so seriously, I'm not kidding. I mean, it's funny. It's definitely a funny story, but like seriously, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. So um, a lot of, you know, how like Hampton Sydney, and, and you know, my brothers have already mentioned multiple things that I definitely resonate with. Um, but I think like one of the biggest things for me is here at Hampton Sydney, especially for you guys up there, right? Like there are so many opportunities on this campus to lead, right? Um, during my tenure here, I was the ma master alchemist uh, one, for one semester. I was the master of ceremonies for two semesters. I was, you know, the secretary or something another semester, right? So there's like so many different opportunities for you to kind of get that feel for how leadership works and how to like run something, right? It's, it's hard, but Hampton Sydney actually gives you that sort of experience or, or you have the opportunity to take advantage of that at Hampton Sydney, right? Um, so that's like one of my, my biggest takeaways, I think. Another thing that I think of when I think of Hampton Sydney is writing. Um, Seriously, I'm not trying to be cliche here. People at work, when I tell them I had to pass a, re a rhetoric exam to graduate, people go like, what? <laughs> Didn't you major in physics? Yeah, yeah, I did. And then they're like, is that why you write, write pretty good? And I'm like, I like to write so. well, write well. <laughs> hey, speaking, speaking and writing are two different things, Mr. Goodman. <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, those, those two things, like for me, whether it's Alpha Chi Sigma or another organization that, you know, the leadership thing, and then just seriously, man, like some of the papers that I've written for Dahlgren have gone all the way, like, you know, for Railgun back in 2016 when I first started, right, have been all the way to flag level, level officer level because 
they're like, this guy can write. He can he can put the technical <laughs> stuff in words. Let's let's use him to send it up to you know make it look good, right? So, um, so I don't know. That is that is definitely gotten me a long way. Like the, those two kind of knowing knowing how to do those those two things. Um, while I've been at Dahlgren, though, just like Kent said, and I believe what Ben also said. When I first graduated, and I was graduated in physics, right? Like you're a master, uh, you're you're jack of all trades, but a master of none, right? When I got to Dahlgren, I was immediately put on like mechanical design, so like designing stuff like this, right? This is a railgun armature um, that's actually been unloaded and loaded. You're you're more than welcome to come up and look at it. But I've got more. I, you know, I'm just talking now. But um, I didn't really, again, these slides, you know, um, where was I? But so, not trying to be embarrassing here. It's just, you know, I put these together at the last minute. I'm, I'm talking about this bullet right here. Like, I had no idea I was going to go and start doing mechanical engineering when I graduated from here. I thought I was going to be like this physics guy or something, or like, I, I don't know. <laughs> Next thing you know, they've got me on SolidWorks doing modeling simulation. Next thing you know, I'm in console or ANSYS multiphysics, and I'm trying to figure out, like, if something's going to go through a plate or not, right? Um, so just like Kent said, I mean, like, you kind of find, find your niche, right? And that was my niche for a long time, like, for six years. And now I'm taking that technical experience I have and now applying it to those specific missions that I mentioned before, right? Hey, how do you mechanically package something? You know, that, that sort of thing, right? So, so anyways, advice for students today. Um, again, some of this stuff has already been said. Uh, you know, Ben said hiring is high right now. Dude, I'm serious, like people want good people, right? Um, so don't be afraid to like go out. If you have any sort of like hesitancy, oh, I don't know if I should talk to that person. Maybe I shouldn't introduce myself to that person. It feels weird. Or, oh, I feel uncomfortable doing that. Don't feel that way. Because most people want to talk to you. Most people want to know your story. Most people want to share their own story, right? Which allows you to learn, right? So, so those things, um, never underestimate the power of hard work. I mean, I was just going over some of my old grades with Dr. Chain. He, he, he kept all that shit, man. Like, I, we, were going, we, we were going over old grades, and I'm like, holy cow, Dr. Chain. How did I make it out of here alive? Um, but I'm telling you, hard tenacity, man. Hard work. So, I mean, that, that speaks for itself. Um, and another thing, for those of you who are making resumes right now, a lot of resumes look good, right? You can, you can have all these buzzwords, all these, oh, I led this, I led... What examples are you giving in your resume? How are you trying to set your resume apart from other people? People don't like to see these buzz general words. Give examples. What actual experience are you bringing to the table? And in my line of work, I don't know about you guys in private industry, but a one-page resume does not exist in my line of work. So... You know, if that means you've got to spill over into a second page because you want to include critical information that shows people what you have actually done in the past, then you do it, in my opinion. I don't know. You guys have industry experience, so I'm a government worker. So, um, Those of you who are planning not to go to grad graduate school, I know that there's always like this kind of, I feel like, oh, maybe I should go or my parents are pushing me to go. You've got to do what's right for you, right? Um, I started a graduate program. I'm going to be completely transparent with you guys right now. I started a graduate program after Hampton Sydney, like while I was working full time. I stopped it because I hated it, right? I want to go back, but I want to do something different now that my career has gone in like a different path, right? So things happen for a reason, right? So don't, if you don't go to graduate school right away or you don't do exactly what your parents are telling you to do or, or, or whatever, you got to do what's right for you. And if you remember the things that we just went over, this, those previous bullets, you will be successful. Okay? No matter what path that you go, always remember those, those other things that we've talked about and my other brothers have talked about today. So without further ado, I want to get into just some, some cool like videos. Um, how much time do I have, Patrick? 
Just all right, show us a rail gun shoot, and I think you're good. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so so yeah. during my time during my time at, at Dahlgren, I worked on both railgun systems and hypervelocity projectile systems. So I'm going to show you a couple of videos. This is one video. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna skip to the next. All right. So this is a hypervelocity projectile that was shot out at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Um, it's kind of anticlimactic. That's anticlimactic. But the the high speed video, the high speed videos are where it's at though. So all this is, so this projectile was designed to be fired either out of five inch guns or out of rail guns, right? And all it is is literally a non. Um, so it doesn't have ordnance in it. It's totally kinet kinetic. So relying on velocity alone, right? So um, it's inside of like Sabo pedals, right? And after it's shot out of the gun, those Sabo pedals are aer aerodynamically stripped off. And then you're just left with the warhead, which I, I shouldn't call it a warhead because there's no ordnance in it, right? You're just left with the projectile, right? So the reason why the Navy loves this, the reason why they're so interested in it is because number one, it's cheap. And number two, you can reach a target that's hundreds of nautical miles away because this thing can travel at, you know, upwards of Mach 8. So, oh, wow. so during World War II, it's just 10 miles away. Mm. Wow. Hundreds of miles. And this was shot out of a 5-inch gun, by the way. Mm. You can actually see the pressure cones and stuff on there from breaking the, the sound barrier. So, uh, won't get into railgun physics too much here. I've got one more. I've got one more cool video to show you, and then that's it. Okay, I promise. We'll we'll no nope, industry partners. That's okay. Nope, we won't do lab launcher. Uh, we won't do the ACL either. Pubic this, release. What was that? Pubic release. That Where is that at? Where? Like that. Oh. <laughs> That's the Navy right there. That's somebody punked me. I didn't even make that. Okay. That's See, probably sitting on like a YouTube channel. It probably <laughs> is. Um, this is a site that this, this is physically a site that I worked on right here. Did a lot of instrumentation and a lot of uh, mechanical development for this. So I'm just going to show you one of the videos that was taken pretty recently. Um, and I say pre pretty recently, but it was within you know the last four years. Um, this one's one of the coolest ones because we were actually doing rep rate firing for this. So this is terminal range. Uh, as you can see, the launcher's in the center, and these are just access platforms. All these containers have capacitors and batteries in them. Mm. It's huge, huge capacitors and batteries. Right. I know the government has to put the music in there and uh, you know get you going. <laughs> but this is a full that's an automated loading system. It's loading a projectile kind of like this into the gun. Loading another one. And here's all the all this waterfall of cables. That's literally what is transferring all that current to the uh, the muzzle of the gun or the breech of the gun. Yep. What causes the smoke? So literally the smoke is from oxidation of aluminum and other materials that make up the gun system. So there is, and I was talking to Dr. Chan, or, or Trey about this earlier today, it's almost unfathomable how much current is actually flowing. I mean, it's on the order of millions of amps, right? But but how much really is that, right? Like, it's hard to really, really understand. I'm serious, you guys are laughing at me, right? But like, like literally, there is so much current flowing through these things that it is just immediately burning and turning the, the materials into plasma, just immediately. And that's what all that smoke and all that junk is, is like plasma and just oxidation. And you chemists know more than I do about that sort of stuff, but it's, it's literally like burning the materials that are 
a, a part of the system, right? Um, because it's so much current. But as I mentioned, there's a lot of behind the scenes. You know, all those videos are cool. And the last thing I'm going to say, last thing I'm going to say, all those videos are cool. You know, O and R likes to use them. Hey, check this out, whatever. But there's a lot of cool stuff that people like me do behind the scenes, right? Whether that's modeling and simulation, or it's you know mechanical design of this, right? What I have right there, right? This is a facility out in Monterey, California that I actually helped design and build, right? So like smaller scale facilities to do like developmental testing. So a lot of that kind of behind the scenes stuff drives the larger scale, um, you know, videos that, that I just showed you. Um, and the last thing I want to say is like this, I do what I do because it's stuff like this right here, okay? When this came out on the news, I, we, we were like, what the, what the heck, right? So, so this, this is why I'm passionate about the work that we do because we're not alone and it's easy to take that for granted because we live here, right? Um, and I haven't talked about this, but we have a huge STEM outreach program too that I'm highly involved with. So, any other questions? Sorry, Patrick. That's right. Thanks.